Okay, so I'm George, and um, first, before I get started, before I forget, I want to thank some people who helped me out with this, preparing for this. Uh, uh, Sam sent me some important information that's going to be used in this talk here, and of course, Catherine was a, a big help in preparing for this. Um, I didn't have anywhere near the time I normally like to have to do one of these things, so if this turns out okay, you are in fact witnessing a miracle. <laughs> so we're going to talk about metals, different kind of metals they used in the Civil War. And we're going to talk about what the metals are, where they come from, a lot of mining operations here, what they are used for, and who used them. Periodic table. Some of you are probably having an allergic reaction right now from <laughs> high school chemistry nightmares about the periodic table. But this is what a lot of the metals are actually elements, uh, basic elements from the table. And we'll just use a few of these when we go through. The first thing we're going to talk about is iron. I did not want this to degenerate into a chemistry 101. This is a history class, but you have to do a little bit of chemistry to understand the history part. So the first thing we're going to do, this is all specific gravity and all that. We're not going to get into all that. Fe is iron. It's really basic. Iron is like 5% of the Earth's crust, crust. It's in all 50 states, uh, so you can mine it almost anywhere. But a lot of it is concentrated uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, from Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, a lot of other mines are there. So there's going to be a lot of mining. Actually, there are a number of elements that are there. And there's going to be a lot of mining activity in the area. And there's still, to this day, there's still a lot of mines in West Virginia. Nothing, things don't change. So mine, miners live in a very, very separate world. It's, it's hard for us to imagine today's society because everything's right here, right at our fingertips, literally. Uh, back in those days, they lived in extremely remote areas. Uh, they could be 100 miles from any town at all. Very, very remote areas, a very uh, separate life from society in general. And in fact, many times they, the only store that they could buy anything from was the company store. And the old cliche about you owe your soul to the company store was literally true. Um, and they were so remote they didn't have banks or anything. Many of the mining companies had created their own economy, their own what they call script, with their own coins. Uh, not be, it has nothing to do with the value of money. It has to do with the fact that there were no, no banks in the area, and they literally had to create their own local economy with physically creating the coins. They're going to do a, use a lot of uh, graft, draft animals. Draft animals are very important back in the day and time, not only on the farm, but in mining as well. This is actually a full-grown horse, but it's a small horse for a reason. They would breed... Uh, here, like genetically modified animals, but that was true way back then too. Every animal has been, every plant has been genetically modified. Uh, they would breed smaller animals that would fit into the mine. They use the same kind of tack, you know, the collar and the hame, all that, just like they do in the, in the field on the farm. But here they're going to use it in the mine. So they're going to use small, breed smaller animals intentionally so they'll fit in there. This is the basic iron ore as it comes out of the ground. Nothing's happened to it yet. This is what it's going to look like. And then what they're going to do is they're going to, of course, melt this down. Uh, the best information I can find, about 2,500 degrees. Uh, I try to be real scientific about it and find the thermometer and all that. I couldn't find anything to, to say that it was exactly 2,500 degrees, but that seems to be what they're doing when they're doing the smelting process to melt down this iron. And they're going to make this into what they call ingots, pig iron ingots, that could be, just be shipped somewhere else to be melted down again uh, to make it into something. Joseph R. Anderson, uh, we could spend many hours talking about him, but we'll only have a few seconds to talk about him. And basically, he was running Trinidad Ironworks before the war even started or anything. He was a general in the Confederate Army. He did fight in the Seven Days Campaign. Um, Lee did a pretty good job of assessing people and their skills and how they could best handle the his best help the Confederacy. And he decided early on that uh, Anderson could do a lot more good for the South if he was not commanding in the field, he was back at, at Tredegar, and so they brought him back to Tredegar to run that during the war, and once he ran it after the war. And Tredegar Ironworks was a pretty big complex back in those days, uh, where they made a lot of things before the war, of course, uh, for the railroads and all that. Uh, there's going to be, uh, shameless plug, there's going to be a new museum at Tredegar. In the next couple of years, they're going to build a new one on that site. The next element we're going to talk about is carbon. Off the periodic table, carbon is a C, and basic carbon looks like that. It looks like coal, but it's not coal. It's actually carbon, one of the elements off the periodic table. 
They're going to take iron and carbon and combine it together into steel. That's where steel comes from. At that, in that time period, it's going to be about 99% iron, about 1% carbon to make steel, which is going to, steel is going to be a harder uh, substance. They make metals softer or harder depending on what the use is going to be. You see that throughout this talk here. Henry Bessemer comes along and he has the Bessemer converter. Um, what he's going to do is he's going to be a, an engineer, for, a British engineer, who's going to convert pig iron into steel. And the Bessemer converter looks like that. It's a very, very crude machine, but it works. And basically what it's going to do is they're going to uh, heat up the material here. The steel is going to form at the bottom and they're going to have this slag and some, uh, some uh, oxygen you know, coming out of there and everything. A very, very crude basic machine, but it works. But it doesn't, create, it doesn't produce that much volume. Carl Siemens later on comes along and Carl Siemens uh, developed the open hearth furnace and this, the reason that he's going to be important and his furnace is going to be important is because of the volume. We're not going to go through all the mechanics of this, it would take hours to go through that. But suffice to say the important thing to learn here is that the volume is going to be much greater. The economic impact is important. If you can produce a much larger volume of anything, the cost per unit comes down, making it more affordable. That also ties in with the financial end of that company. They're more likely to make a profit if they can produce a larger volume of something, most anything, including iron and steel. So that's the important part of that. During peacetime, they're going to use wrought iron for lots and lots of uh, basic everyday things. It depends on where you travel, where you've been. I know in some parts of North Carolina, they had foundries, and you go through a town, and every single yard had this wrought iron fence. <laughs> every yard in the town because there was a, it was a foundry close by. Locality really matters quite a bit in what you can get. And really mundane things, cast iron skillets, we've all seen those you know, throughout our lives during the peacetime. They're going to be using draft animals a lot. They're going to, they're going to use draft animals and they're going to uh, use steel bits for the animal. This is an important part to understand. When you're working on the farm, and which many people in the South, even some people in the North, were dependent upon farm income, you cannot possibly make a living by yourself scratching the ground with hand tools. You've got to have help. They are dependent upon the draft animals. Their relationship with the draft animals, very, very important. The way they communicate with the draft animals is going to be through the bit in their mouth right here. Unlike what you see on TV when you watch a cowboy show and he jumps on the hero, jumps on the horse, runs off into the sunset, and the horse is perfectly behaved every time. In real life, it's not always like that at all. Uh, every, all these animals have their own personalities. Back in those days, they had not early stages of breeding uh, different personalities. They had their good days and bad days. Animal does not always do what you want them to do. They communicate to the animal through the bit. And so they have to try a lot of different bits in order to find out which one that particular animal likes. They use horses, mules, and oxen, and every animal is different. And they'll like some, not, I just got four examples here. But if you go to a tack shop today, you'll see a wall with hundreds of different kinds of bits. The reason for that, you've got to get the right one for each individual animal so that animal will like it and cooperate. Most of the horses have, they have teeth here, they have teeth right here, and they have a gap in between. This is really their, their gums. You got something in there that's touching their gums, really, really sensitive. You're dependent on that animal to make a living, and you better be, treat him right, or he's not going like, to like it, he's not going to cooperate. So they go to a lot of trouble to make sure these steel bits are comfortable in the animal's mouth. When the, or, when the war comes along, this is going to be the first war in which you're going to have ironclad vessels, and most, most of us already know that. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of metal in this ship here as well. Down below decks, of course, you've got a steam engine going on down there. You can only imagine how hot it was down there. Brutal. Uh, but they had to, to use the metal plates on here to fend off the cannonballs. And later on, I'll show you a plate that they tested when they shot uh, a cannonball up against the plate to test it to see if it would withstand you know, being attacked or not. And the South had a CSS Virginia. The North used, of course, the USS Monitor. A very different design, but basically the same kind of an approach. They're trying to use metal to protect the ship from cannonballs. They're thinking that these metal ships can defeat wooden ships. And in battle, of course, they, of course they did. So this was pretty successful in taking warfare to another level. 
Uh, they're going to use, we all know about artillery, cannonballs and, and cannons and all that. They're going to make these, they're going to make a lot of these during the war at Tredegar. Um, it takes a lot of time to do that. When they make this in a mold, they have to let it cool. It takes many, many hours for it to cool down. So the making of these was a very slow process, actually. But they made, of course, many of these, both north and south, for the war effort. Uh, they use steel for a lot for medical instruments. During wartime, of course, you have enormous numbers of wounded, and many of them are going to be, receive medical treatment, which is part of warfare. Uh, they're going to make, use different kinds of metal for s several different parts of this pistol. This is all going to be steel up here for the barrel. There's a little bit of brass. We'll talk about brass in a few minutes. Uh, a little bit of brass here and then wood down here. So pretty much locally where they're making, making these weapons, whatever they had available at that time, pretty much. The Lamat pistol was different. This is all steel from one end to the other. This is all steel here. And the cavalry used the Lamat pistol a lot. That's very popular. The railroads use enormous volumes of steel. <laughs> and they're going to use all the rails and the ties, the tie plates, all that are going to be made of steel. They're going to use this in great quantities. And the interconnectedness between the, the, the uh, foundries, the manufacturing, and the philosophy of, a comp of the user is important to understand. The long-term thinking is the culture of railroading. Long-term thinking. That means they, they produce, long before the war, huge quantities of extra tie plates, ties, steel rails, all that kind of thing. That's how they can repair the damage during the war. So the volume is tremendous for this. The steam engine itself uses several different kinds of, of metal depending on what's going to happen with the steam engine. They can even make the tender out of wood. That doesn't really matter. But most of the, the, uh, the, uh, um, the boiler itself is going to be steel. If it's available, they'll sometimes make the piston out of brass. And that's really where most of the pressure is. Uh, there's pressure throughout the, the barrel, the, um, the uh, rest of the engine. But when they open the valves and let the steam into the piston, that's where there's going to be almost like an explosion of a cannon where there's a lot of pressure in there, a lot of heat in there, and the brass can withstand it better than a steel can. But they'll use steel when they have to. The old adage about steel wheels and steel rails is, of course, true. The next item we're going to talk about is copper, which is going to be Cu off the periodic table. And the copper mines are, copper is going to be a lot harder to find. You have to go out west here, the central and western part, to find the copper mines. So that's going to be, and imagine back in those days, you didn't have the quick transportation you have today. So that was a lot harder to find. You had to go out further west to, find, to mine the copper. And of course, we're back to mining. All this involves mining. They are using mules in this case right here. And you can see the very early lamps they have for their, uh, the lighting down below ground. And they've actually built a railroad down in the mine with switches and everything so they can bring the raw materials out of the ground. They extrude it from the ground. This is copper when it comes out of the ground, just raw copper. They haven't melted it down yet. This is what it's going to look like. Zinc is going to be the next element we're going to use. And they're going to use it for several things here. Zn is going to be zinc. And the zinc is going to be found pretty much up and down the East Coast a lot. That was easy to find because it was closer. Most of the war, most of the activity is up and down the East Coast, of course. Uh, and so the zinc was close by and pretty easy to mine there. And they're using mules for this, of course. They're, uh, again, they're, they built a railroad. They've got the same kind of tack that they would have for other uses for draft animals. And they're going to zinc out of the mine. Zinc looks like this when it first comes out of the ground. And what they're going to do is combine copper and zinc to make brass. This is where brass comes from. There are a lot of different kinds of brass. Some is much softer, some much, much harder. What they were using back in those days, 1860s, was on the chart we have today, they would call that yellow brass. A lot of other kinds, but they were using yellow brass, which is about 75% copper, about 25% zinc. That was one of the harder forms of brass for a reason. What they were used the brass for, things like 
musical instruments. You want the sound to resonate within a musical instrument. And if you study military history anywhere in the world, you always find music has always been part of it, always will be. But they wanted to use the harder brass for that to make it resonate within the instrument. They're going to use this for brass knuckles. Little known fact, Abraham Lincoln's bodyguards had brass knuckles. It didn't help them, but they did have them. They're going to use brass sometimes for cannon barrels when it's available. When they fire the cannon, there's actually an explosion right around in here, and it's a very violent explosion. A lot of heat builds up, and during the battle, they're going to fire the, can the cannon many, many times, and brass can, han han can handle it better than some other types of metal. So they're going to use brass there when it's available. They're going to use it even for telescopes out in the field. It's good because brass really doesn't rust easily at all. So it's good to have out, you're out in the woods, out in the weather, that sort of thing. The telescope will still work. These are parts of the pistol. They're going to use, this is going to be steel here. It's going to be brass. This part is going to be brass. And of course, wood down here for the Colt pistol. These are for part of the saber, the scabbard part. This part right here is going to be brass. And it looks nice, too. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's for functional, and sometimes it's ornamental. And the brass just looks nice. Gold is going to be the next element we're going to look at off the periodic table. And gold is going to be AU. We're all very familiar with gold. And gold is going to be found in a lot of places. We've all, we've all heard about, and they're all true stories, about the gold rush, gold rush in California, a couple of those. There was even a little gold rush in Georgia at one point. And there were two really major gold rushes up in Alaska many years ago, uh, some famous stories about that. But in the long run, when all the excitement calms down and everything, a lot of the gold, again, we're back in the Appalachian Mountains, back in the mountain areas, and a lot of the deposits in the ground are in this area. So a lot of the gold mines in that area right there. <clears throat> they're going to use sometimes oxen for gold mines. You see how low the ceiling is. Again, they're breeding the animals smaller so they can fit in there. Uh, you, you treat the oxen a little differently um, because they're, they don't always get along with each other. <laughs> and they have horns and they'll, they'll actually jab each other with the horns. They keep, have a yoke in between so to keep them a little bit separated so they cooperate. And these are all herd animals. They would prefer, some of the pictures you'll see, a lone individual mule. That animal's not as happy as the others because they're herd animals. They'd prefer to work with others. They just they like to be with a herd. Raw gold looks like this. We first take it out of the ground. They haven't melted it down quite yet. And they're going to make this, of course, into coins, as we all know. All around the world, they use gold for coins. And they're going to use gold for jewelry as well. This is the first time looking at stars. We're going to see stars several times uh, in this talk because Ladies' fashion has always been a problem. It's important to ladies' fashion. It always has been, always will be. And at that point in time, in the 1860s, one thing that was very popular was the theme of stars. So they have stars on jewelry. You're going to see stars in other places, too, here in a minute. AG is going to be silver. That's the next element we're going to use in, from the periodic table. And AG is going to be silver. And raw silver looks like this coming out of the ground before they mold it into what they're going to make out of it. They're going to make this into coins, of course. Uh, very durable. You know, coins last a lot longer than paper money does, so they use, make it in, into coins. They make it into jewelry. Another shameless plug, we sell all this jewelry I'm going to show you in <laughs> the haversack. You can go upstairs and buy it right after this talk. So we make it into charms. I uh, have a little canteen charm. Just at von Liebig, you probably, you may have never heard this gentleman, but he had an impact on you since you woke up this morning. It's very likely that he had an impact on your life. What he did was he took a piece of glass. He painted the back of the piece of glass with the element silver, and he created a mirror. 1830. There were mirrors, crude mirrors before that, but he's credited with this type of a mirror, which is a little more refined, a little higher quality mirror. Recycling. Recycling was going on long before the Civil War. Uh, 
recycle it of metals what I'm referring to. Um, in this case here, you have the, the citizens who have their loved ones out in the army, they're out, away from home, they're in the war, and they really are concerned about them. And in some way, they could possibly help their husbands, sweethearts or in, in the army. So they express their gratitude for the good citizens of Mecklenburg County for the prompt aid in this, our hour of need, for the donation of brass metals to be melted down and made into light artillery. Now, light artillery was quite useful for the cavalry. Cavalry sometimes carried a very, very small cannon behind them as the rear guard so they could shoot a grape shot if they were being chased. They had a very small cannon with narrow wheels on it so they could fit to these little paths that are going through the woods. And it, actually, some of these were made of metals that were like, just like they melt down the church bells just to help out their, their loved ones who were away at war. You know, some way of them helping without just sitting home and worrying about it all the time. The Lord, this led me to one more thing. It's a little bit off track, but I want to hit this anyway because um, the, the, the loyalty was not just to the North or the South. It wasn't even to their own state sometimes. Here they're talking about the backs are never turned until ordered, but ordered, and we will never disgrace our native county. They were, a lot of the flags you see upstairs are very local flags. Their thinking, their feeling was not just about federal and state, but even their local county. That's what they're fighting for during the war, the way they looked at it. The next element we have is tin, which is SN from the periodic table. And tin's a little bit different. It's going to come from something called cassiterite. They actually mine cassiterite and extract the tin from that. And they're going to make that for some pretty mundane stuff, you know, mess kits, things like that. To this day, you still get a Boy Scout mess kit. Made of tin, you know. Some things don't change much. They have made they have foundry work not just at Tritiger, but down in Alabama, near Birmingham, Alabama. They had one place that was particularly good at doing this at Tannehill Ironworks. They could make cannon barrels there similar to what they would do here at Tritiger. The reason this matters is because. The South, the geographically, is a pretty, pretty spread out. They had these coastal defenses that they needed to uh, make cannons for to protect the coasts, the coasts. And so they had forts all along the coast. Some of these are going to be Chapman paintings. One more, shameless plug, we sell all the Ch Chapman paintings at the museum, all 39 of them. But they had, they had coastal defenses. These are done by Chapman. He was a Confederate soldier who was actually stationed along the coast. And he was a good artist. He did all these landscape-type paintings. There's another one here. This one is a little bit better. You can see the actual cannon barrel made at Tannehill. And they ship it directly, this is in Alabama, directly east to the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, uh, for the coastal defenses. And one more shot here. This is the cannon barrel right here. Again, made at Tannehill. It shipped there so they could defend the coastline. They had blockade runners. They had blockade runners because of the, uh, the Union ships trying to block off the edge of the, the uh, circumference of the Confederacy and because of the, the war activity and because of the Union ships stopping shipments, uh, they had these blockade runners because of the shortages of practically everything. As the war went on, there were so many shortages of things, it was, it was hard to get most anything. Even if you had money, there's not much to buy, really. So they would smuggle things in. They would smuggle things in like needles. These are actually, I don't know if you can see, these are actually needles made of steel. And we have some notes here indicating that at some point, not because of the value of money, don't get hung up on the value of Confederate dollars. We're talking about the shortage of actual coins. If you don't have any banks around and you don't have access, physical access to coins, in some cases they actually use needles as currency. Confederate prisoners. These are prisoners, a uh, famous picture here of Confederate prisoners at Gettysburg. Um, this is not to in any way minimize the horrors of war. Uh, being in a prison, not fun. The guards don't even want to be there. Nobody wants to be at a prison. Uh, it's a terrible place. There are atrocities committed against prisoners sometimes. Uh, not a happy place at all. Don't want to diminish that reality. 
But even in a bad situation like that, you occasionally have little good things that could pop up there. Many of these guys here were, long before the war, skilled artisans and craftsmen. They had a lot of skill and they could actually make things like jewelry. They have a lot of time on their hands. They're sitting in prison all day long. They're thinking about their sweethearts at home. They want to make something for her and so they can do that. This is actually gold, AU. That's gold right there. You think, how in the world did prisoners get gold? They don't have access to the outside world. Well, they do. Once in a while, they would strike up a little friendship with one of the guards. And talking to the guards, he realized that this guy could make some really nice jewelry. He wants to make something for his sweetheart at home. So he, the guard smuggles in gutta bircha wood. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. The wood and a little piece of gold. And of course, the, the prisoner can do all this flowery where he can do all this artwork himself. The reason that would happen is beneficial for both. The prisoner has access now to some materials. He can make something and use up his time and make something for his wife at home, whatever, and he'll make some extra ones and give them back to the guard who brought those things in. The guard will in turn sell them and make money. So the guard made money off this deal and the prisoner got to do what he wanted to do as well. So mutually beneficial. The wood has come from a good aperture tree, very, very soft wood. I don't know if you ever, when you were a kid, you might have made a model out of balsa wood. Balsa wood is very, very soft. This is also a very soft wood. He could just take that little piece of gold and just push it right into the wood. It was so soft and easy to work with. They didn't need too many tools to work with that. But that's what Gouda Percha is. Again, we see the stars here. This is a star on the ring here. The, the, the ladies like stars on their jewelry, things like that. Again, this is the Gouda Percha. Uh, quite a bit of, of woodwork in here, quite a bit of hand carving, all these different layers and everything. But again, it's a very soft wood and they could easily work with it. All these rings, by the way, are in the collection here at the museum. Not always on display, but they're in this building. Um, some diamond inlay, here's some metal inlay for this and this. Again, it's so soft you can just push the metal right into the wood. And some more metal inlay. A lot of these guys were really quite good, they were good artists. They could make nice jewelry even under prison conditions. Once again, we see the stars. Very popular to have stars on rings and earrings, that sort of thing. This, you can't really read this too much. This says friendship on here. They can actually carve words into it. It says friendship on there. And a little bit of metal inlay there. Nathan Bedford Forrest, um, you all heard of him. He fought at Murfreesboro, Chattanooga, Fort Pillow, and made many cavalry raids throughout the war. He was an important uh, cavalry leader for the Confederacy, and we have in the collection his, the bit for his horse's mouth. Remember we talked about bits earlier, how they were all so different, and how they had to fit that particular animal, had to like that particular bit. This was the one for his, his horse that he rode. A.P. Hill is another important figure. He's a leader of the Third Corps, fought at uh, Gettysburg, Spotsylvania Courthouse, Seven Days, Cedar Mountain, the Wilderness. He fought throughout the war, was killed just before the end of the war. And we have in the collection his spurs. These are made of steel. Once again, they use whatever metals available at that time. And by the way, some of the people who are in the Army are also helping to design these things. If you study people like Jeb Stewart, people like that, they were helping to actually design and refine and improve things like their accoutrements on their horses and things like that, the harnesses for their horses, spurs, things like that. So you'll see some, if you really study it deep, you'll find that they made some changes throughout the war that improved it. Some of the spurs, some of the brass, the brass spurs they have were made of brass. It might just look a little bit nicer. This is what I was talking about earlier. This is the armor plate that they used to test the, test the metal when they were making a CSS Virginia before they built the ship. They wanted to see, can this thing hold back a cannonball? So they shot a cannonball at it, and there's a dent here. I think this is like two inches, two, two inches thick, I think. 
Uh, and they were testing this, and they saw this, they realized they could stop it, but let's make it a little thicker because we want to make sure it doesn't come through and hit the men inside. This is the telegraph wire. This is made of, sometimes made out of copper uh, because metal would conduct electricity. And you can find out a whole lot about the telegraph wire in your homework assignment. Yes, I have the audacity to give you homework. <laughs> you go to YouTube and look up Railroad Communications 1864. There's a whole talk that I did about railroad communications involving that wire. And uh, that talk will explain all about it. Um, and thank you for coming.